Hello, and welcome to our program. My name is Sam Ankerson. I'm the director at the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum in Sanibel. And we're delighted you've joined us for Saving the Queen of the Sea, Queen Conch Conservation Aquaculture with Dr. Megan Davis. This program is the fourth in our summer and fall free Zoom lecture series, which is made possible by a gift from Mark and Kathy Helge. Thank you, Mark and Kathy. The fifth lecture, fifth and final lecture, will be Thursday, October 13th. Its title is Land Snails in Los Angeles, an Experiment in Urban Citizen Science. It's by Dr. Jan Vandetti, the curator of malacology at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. It'll be a great talk and like all the others, it's free. Uh, to, for more information or to register, you can visit the museum's website, uh, shellmuseum.org and under the education section, click on lectures and uh, you can find everything there. Tonight's program and all previous Zoom lectures offered by the museum are uh, recorded and are available for you to view anytime. They are also located on the education lectures section of the museum's website. And Dr. Davis's talk, we, we hope will be up uh, within 24 hours, but, uh, but not, not less than 48. So if you'd like to forward it along to friends, uh, it'll be available soon on the museum's website. Following Dr. Davis's presentation and slides, we'll have time for questions and answers. We're in the Zoom webinar format. So if you have questions, use the chat function along the bottom of your screen, click on chat and then type in your questions. Uh, you can do that at any time. You don't need to wait until the presentation is over. And we'll, um, so we'll have a record of those questions. And then, and then after the slides, we'll be able to get to the questions uh, one by one. And actually, if, if you'll indulge me, last month's lecture, we had, a, um, we had a little bit of a hiccup with the chat function. I think it's been corrected. If, if, anyone, if anyone attending would do me a favor and just um, click on chat and, and type anything to make sure that I see it. Um, I would appreciate it. Got it. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Gail. Okay. <laughs> it's working. Okay, good. Thanks, guys. Um, so that's how you can ask your questions. So tonight, or today, it is our privilege to spend some time with, with Megan Davis, a scientist, researcher, world traveler, uh, conservation entrepreneur, and much more. Um, her work in protecting and growing populations of the iconic Queen Conch is inspiring and impactful, as you will discover. As an institution here at the museum, we're honored to have known Dr. Davis for a long time. Uh, she is a, a pioneer of international mollusk con conservation, and frankly, uh, I think she's just one of the coolest people working in our field and we're just really, really grateful that she um, is here to, to share some of what she does um, with all of you. Dr. Davis is research professor at the Aquaculture and Stock Enhancement Program, Florida Atlantic, U Florida Atlantic University Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute in Fort Pierce, Florida. She's worked in aqu aquaculture for over four decades. She spent 10 years in the Turks and Caicos Islands as co-founder and chief scientist for the world's largest queen conch farm. And she and her team currently work on queen conch restoration and conservation community partnership projects in Florida, the Bahamas, Puerto Rico, and other locations in the Caribbean. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Megan Davis. Thank you very much, Sam, for that lovely welcome. And hello to all of you. Thank you so much for joining today. I'm so excited to share our work with the Queen Conch and also um, have discussions with you along the way. So as Sam said, today's lecture will be about saving the Queen of the Sea and Queen Conch Conservation Aquaculture. Conservation Aquaculture is 
a term that means using aquaculture, the farming of a species, and in this case, conch, to be able to do restoration and conservation of the species. So that's what we're going to talk about today. First, I'll start off with a little bit of my background on how I fell in love with the queen conch. And so you can see me sailing here in the um, left-hand side. Um, I was very fortunate that our father would take us sailing in the summer times to the Bahamas. We lived in Miami at the time. I'm originally from Australia, but we moved to the United States when I was seven. And so when we were in Miami, we would sail to the Bahamas and that's where I met the conch for the very first time. And the fishers there uh, introduced me to the conch and I thought, oh my gosh, this animal is so beautiful. It's such an important species in the environment. It's, um, it's also easy to fish. And of course we know that it's also very tasty. So at that time of age 15, 16, I had already made up my mind that I was gonna be a conch farmer. And so I set my course for my career and my life based on that um, falling in love with the Queen Conch then. After I finished my undergraduate studies at Florida Institute of Technology in Jensen Beach at the time, they had a campus there. I moved to the Turks and Caicos Islands and lived there for 10 years. I lived in a tent. Um, I had a wooden car and I, um, was living the life of a conch farmer. And from the small, the small facility on Pine Key in Turks and Caicos, from there we went to Providentialis, um, which is the next bigger island over in the Turks and Caicos. And you can see in the bottom center here, this is an overview of the Queen Conch, the only commercial conch farm that was ever developed. And I was one of the co-founders and helped to develop the large scale technology that's used to raise the queen conch, which we still use today. So that farm um, was in operation until just a few years ago. And we were raising about a million conch a year. So I was there for 10 years. And after that, I left and pursued more of my graduate studies at that time. And then I continued to work with the queen conch and, and set up different hatcheries in the Bahamas and throughout the Caribbean. And so my career and my conch farming days are still um, going strong. So the queen conch, as many of you might know, is one of seven different strombidae species that are in the Caribbean. And in the bottom, you can see the milk conch, you can see a fighting conch, that one's a Florida fighting conch. There's also a West Indian fighting conch. You can see a small uh, hawkwing conch. There's also the rooster tail. And then in Brazilian area, there's also the goliath. Um, so most of them, except for the goliath, span throughout the Caribbean. You can see the map here. The queen conch ranges from Florida, Central America, Mexico, throughout the Caribbean, down into Venezuela, and also in Bermuda. The queen conch now is called Alligator gigas. It used to be Strombus gigas. After, um, a few years ago, it was changed to Lobatus gigas. So right now, it is Alligator gigas. And as many of you probably know already from our discussions, but also if you visited the islands and, and know about the Queen Conch, it's very much part of the history. It's such an important cultural icon in the Caribbean. You see it um, adorning houses, you see it on fences, you see it on the emblem of the Bahamas, um, uh, emblem there, you can see it down in the keys on flags. So it's very, very popular and integrated into all aspects of Caribbean life. So as you can imagine, there is a plight going on with the Queen Conch 
because it is a most significant molluscan fishery in the Caribbean. So when I first started being introduced to the conch over 40 years ago, queen conch was also fish then, but it wasn't as easily transported. It wasn't until in the 1970s that you could actually harvest the conch and it could be frozen and then it could be shipped um, around the world. And so really over time, it's become more and more fished. Um, the majority for the meat and the pink shell is a byproduct of the, the fishing. The ecological role that it plays as a keystone herbivore, meaning a very important grazer in seagrass habitats is very much at the front of our minds when we talk about conservation and restoration is to be able to replenish those seagrass beds, which are one of the, one of the most important habitats um, in our ocean. So in terms of fishing, there's many communities that depend upon it for subsistence eating. Um, and then of course, for their livelihoods. And it's very much an artisanal fishing in most of the Caribbean islands. However, in some cases it, it is fished at a more commercial level. So through the fishing and through some habitat loss due to storms or human input, there has been this large population decline. And it was in 1992 that conch was added to the CITES, which is the Convention of International Trade of Endangered Species. And it was added to Appendix 2, which means it can be fish, but it, the countries that fish it must have a sustainable fishing management plan. And that is the case that's happening in the Caribbean so there's not only the CITES regulations, but there's also regulations um, throughout the Caribbean, which I'll show you in just a second. I want to tell you and bring to your attention that NOAA Fisheries recently released a proposed rule to list the conch as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. This is a long review that NOAA did, and now it's out for comment for the next 60 days. And so if you're interested to learn more about this proposed rule, you'll be able to find it through the NOAA Fisheries website. So what are some of the regulation examples? We know in Florida, there's been a moratorium on the Queen Conk since 1986. We're seeing some resurgence of the population, but not to the levels that it would be able to be opened again for, for fisheries. In the Bahamas, they just recently closed export and they have a quota system. In places such as Puerto Rico, there is a closed season, it's happening right now and conch fishing won't open up again until November 1st. In almost all the Caribbean, there is a minimum size um, in terms of the shell length, but mostly the, the lip, the lip must be flared with a, a thickness of about 15 millimeters. And that way we know that it's sexually mature. And this is the time that it can be harvested because it's had a chance to reproduce. You'll see other types of regulations like uh, no scuba or no take zones as well. Um, in marine protected areas. So just a little bit about the Queen Conch Lab here at Harbor Branch at uh, Florida Atlantic University, Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. So our mission is to grow conch for the sake of the species and the ecosystem, which we talked about, the seagrass bed, and also those people in the community that depend on the fishery. So we take a holistic approach to our mission and our vision is for there to be a queen conch farm in every Caribbean nation. And I'd like to share more about that with you. We work in the areas of conservation, aquaculture, research, and also education. So for, for some of you that might not be familiar with where we're located, we're on the east coast of Florida in Fort Pierce. And that's where the Queen Conch Lab is headquarters. That's where I am today. And you can see 
throughout the Caribbean that we have these um, filled in dots, which are current project sites. And then we have pros prospective project sites where we're talking with those in the countries about in fact having a queen conch farm in every Caribbean nation. So today I'm gonna tell you and share with you some of the projects that we have throughout the Caribbean and what, what we're doing in these various places. Before I get started on that, let's just briefly review the life cycle. And here you can see the queen conch in the drawing at the bottom, you can see the male and the female, and they do need to come together to copulate. And you can see in the photograph on the lower right-hand side that the male comes up next to the female and the male has a verge. You can see that in the photo here, the verge, and the female has an egg groove. So the only way that they can reproduce is through copulation. So they have to be able to find each other. The female lays an egg mass and she lays it during the warm time of the year. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. They hatch, the eggs hatch, and they hatch into villagers, which have about a 21 day larval cycle. And then they go through metamorphosis and settle into the substrate, into the sand, into the benthos. And they stay there buried, hiding for about the first year. And then they come out of the sand. And then it takes them about three, three years until they develop the flared lip and four years until they're sexually mature. So we're gonna visit each of these life stages as we go through the presentation. And what I'd like to do is take you down to Naguabo, Puerto Rico. And we're gonna talk about aquaculture and the life cycle in an aquaculture setting. Our project is a partnership project with the Harbor Branch and Conservation Conciencia, and also the Fishing Association, along with NOAA Fisheries. And why do we choose Puerto Rico? So it is an artisanal fishery. The majority of the conch that's fished in Puerto Rico is eaten there. It's not exported. It's all eaten within the, within the island of Puerto Rico. They have a Queen Conch Fisheries Management Plan that's put together by the Caribbean Fisheries Management Council. The fishing in federal waters is not allowed, it's prohibited. So all the fishing that's done is only in the local waters, which is managed by the Department of Environmental Protection. And then the conch that's consumed locally is sold for about nine to $14 a pound. So one of the reasons that we came down to Puerto Rico and started a project there is because of the huge impact that Maria had, Hurricane Maria had on the fisheries and the fishing communities. And if you look at this graph here, you can see in 2016, prior to Maria, on a conch harvesting month in November, at one of the fishing associations, there was 8,000 pounds of conch collected in that November. A year later after Maria, there was only 400 pounds of conch collected. So what happened is that the near shore waters got covered, um, covered the conch and disrupted the habitats where the conch live. And still to this day, most of the conch fishing in Puerto Rico is in more of the deeper waters rather than the shallow waters. So as I mentioned, this is a collaborative project in the community, and it's with my colleagues, Raimunda Espinoza and Carlos Velasquez. And this is truly a partnership project with, um, with these organizations working together, working with the fishers and working with the local uh, community and staff. This is a picture of the Fishing Association which is um, located on the water. And I mentioned that we are funded by NOAA Fisheries through a Salt and Salt Kennedy NOAA Fisheries grant. We also have funding from USDA and also Puerto Rico Sea Grant. So where are we located exactly? Here you can see San Juan on the northeastern side of Puerto Rico. And then you can see the star, the red star here, this is the town of um, 
Naguabo. It's on the Malacan of Naguabo on a beach called Huqueras Beach. And then if you look on this bottom photo here, you can see the red arrow. And this is the actual bay where we're located um, in this small community here. These are the partners and the staff that work on the project. There's Raimundo. Um, he is with, as I mentioned, Conservation Conciencia. We have Marie, who's, who's the hatchery assistant. She's married to one of the fishers. We have Chalier and Paula. They're both aquaculture research biologists. And we have Edna, who's our hatchery manager and aquaculture manager. And then we have um, Carlos over here and also Julio, who are associated with the, um, with the Naguabo Fishing Association. And there's 22 different fishers that work there. And then um, here I am featured. You'll often see me putting plumbing together. It's one of my favorite things to do in aquaculture. I always tell the staff, that the, whenever I see PVC, I always think we can create life with PVC because you can put it together and run salt water through it, and then you can start to grow conch. So just briefly, our objectives of the project is to operate a pilot scale hatchery, which we're doing now. Um, we open the facilities up for others to come and learn, not only from Puerto Rico, but other places in the Caribbean. We are also looking at increasing the value of the conch meat and also increasing the value of the queen conch shell and then expanding the project to other places in Puerto Rico. So we start off first with the egg masses. So although we have been successful raising conch in terms of captive conch and having them breed in captivity, it's still not reliable. So what we do is we ask the fishers to go to their sites and to bring back a very small piece of the egg mass, only about one eighth of the egg mass. And they bring it back in the bags that you can see here and inside a bucket. In fact, we just got new eggs today in Puerto Rico. And then we process the eggs. This is one of the fishers helping us with processing. When we process the eggs, it's really to gently tease them apart so that they'll have better water flow when we put it in the incubator. So here you can see the conch egg mass being collected. And here's a full egg mass. You can see it's about six to eight inches long. So we're only bringing in a small portion of it. Every egg mass has a half a million eggs. And the female lays the egg mass from about um, March until October, and in some places year round, such as Puerto Rico, the female will lay up to 10 egg masses every season when she's um, in, the, in the spawning season. So at the bottom here, you can see the egg development. When they first come in, they're just like a single cell that you can see. And then by day two, they start to have many cells that have divided. By day three, they start to show their shell. It's the same exact shell they keep their entire life. They start to show their little lobes that they're gonna use when they hatch. You can see the lobes here, they're dark rimmed. You can see a tiny little eye spot. And the orange that you can see here is the beginning of the foot. And the rest of the conch here is the shell. So even in their tiniest state, they have all the things that they need in order to survive once they hatch. And so this is a schematic of our hatchery. And you can see here's the eggs. This is our egg incubator. We have the larval tanks here. We have the metamorphosis tanks. And then we also raise microalgae and we have a microalgae area. So I'm gonna show you some other photos now. But before I show you more details on the hatchery, we have to talk about where does our water come from? Because we all that PVC that we have needs water to flow. And so we're very fortunate being right here on the bay. And so what we do when we need salt water, we run a pipe out and we do this every two to three weeks. And then we pump it into these large reservoirs. 
the reservoirs each are 2,000 gallons. So now we have two of them. So we can hold up to 4,000 gallons of salt water on site. It gets filtered through very small micron filter mesh bags. And then we also run it through an ultraviolet sterilizer. So here's a, here's a look inside the hatchery. And I spoke about the egg incubator, which is here. And then Victoria is standing next to the larval tank. I'm standing in the back near metamorphosis in the microalgae area. And then Raimundo is looking under the microscope. So it looks like a fairly big space, but in fact, it's only eight feet wide by 18 feet long. So we really did a lot of good planning to be able to fit everything we need in this hatchery space. It's designed to be able to produce 2000 conch every year. So that's our goal. Here you can see the eggs incubating and they incubate with a screen on the bottom and the water flows up through and then they get a continual flow of, of seawater. Here's one of the eggs incubating. And then when they hatch, so they hatch at nighttime and we go into the lab at around nine o'clock which is when they hatch. And they all come out of the egg and they swim around and they look like these little guys here. These are newly hatched veligers. We call them veligers, which is the name of a molluscan larvae. And then about 21 days later, they have these long elongated lobes. You can see the shell very clearly in the foot. And then they go through metamorphosis. And here's the algae, here's Marie, our hatchery assistant, and this is the microalgae that we're growing. Let's just step through the stages of the larval cycle. Here's your newly hatched two lobe villager, which is about the size of a dot, um, like the period at the end of the sentence. And you can see they have their two, their two lobes and their two eyes. And then by day four, they've developed four lobes and their shell's gotten bigger. Their shell has these two lobes, two worlds by that stage. And then by about six to 10 days old, they start to develop their six lobes. They've put on another whorl in their shell. And then you saw earlier their elongated lobes. They have um, six very long lobes and they have three worlds on their shell. And then by the time they're ready for metamorphosis, which is typically three to four weeks after they hatch, they have a shell that's one to 1.2 millimeters in size. So at this point, they're about the size of the top of a pin. And that gives you an idea of how small they still are. They have all their lobes still, but at this stage, they're getting ready to become a benthic snail instead of a free swimming larvae. So how do we help them with metamorphosis? Here you can see the larvae. And so what's so interesting about this stage, they've been swimming around with their lobes, which allows them to collect their phytoplankton for eating. It also allows them to swim and to respire. And so what they need to get ready for at metamorphosis is to be able to graze with their proboscis. And that's what's developing right here. And they also have changed their pigments from orange to now a dark green. They've also developed a set of gill, gill filaments. And they have a heart that's their adult heart that's being developed. So there's all these changes going on and they begin to do this activity called a swim crawl, where they test the bottom, they determine whether or not this is the right place for them to stay. So what we do is we provide them some seagrass, the trital blades that has all these beautiful diatoms and epiphytes on them. And that cues them to go through metamorphosis. And here you can see but this is a metamorphous conch. It no longer has the lobes. It has a tiny proboscis and it's moving around the bottom with its foot. And in the lower photos, you can see these tiny little specks here. 
These are the conch that are grazing the algae that we fed them. And then a more up close look at conch that are about one month old after metamorphosis. They, they, they're like little vacuum cleaners, they're like little hoovers, they go along and they do a really good job of cleaning up. And of course, as they clean, they grow. So the next stage after metamorphosis is called the nursery system. And we have a nursery system that has these tanks that you can see three high. And you can see Paula and Chalier are doing some measurements, which we do every couple of weeks to see how well they're growing. You can see the feed. We make a feed out of olva, which is a green seaweed, along with gelatin and some chow. That's, um, that's actually fed to shrimp, but the conch also like it. So we grind it all up together and make this uh, gel diet, which we feed to the conch. And you can see them here on the sand. So we provide sand for them because it's really important for their shell growth. And here's a nice close up. You can see it's proboscis, it's eyes. You can see that we measure using a caliper. So our conch right now are about five, to six centimeters. And we're trying to get them to seven to eight centimeters until they're ready for release. So we're getting closer um, all the time. So what will happen when we release the conch? It's going to be really important that we choose a number of different um, uh, criteria. And so one of the most important things is we mentioned the shell size. We also wanna make sure that their shells are strong and that's why we include sand in their growing area along with a highly nutritious feed. We wanna make sure that it's got its spines to help them with um, warding off predators. The time of day and the year, it's been discovered that the fall time is a good time. Also the lunar phase that it's, it's good at when it's very dark outside. Um, we'll stock it at a density that's similar in the wild and we'll condition them. So what we'll do is we'll acclimate them to the field. We'll use a pen in area, put the conch in there, let them get used to their native environment, get used to feeding and bearing, and then we'll be able to release them uh, into their habitat. And we'll watch them and watch their movement. And down at the bottom here, you can see a really nice display of a queen conch that's about a year and a half old. Here's a two-year-old conch, two and a half-year-old conch. The three-year-old conch has a, has a thin lip. And then the, the four to five-year-old conch has spilled in its lip. Now conch live to be about 40 years old, but at that stage, they've got a very, very thick shell. So we're gonna pop back up the Caribbean to the Bahamas so I can share a little bit about the work that we're doing there. So we're working with um, groups in the Bahamas that are working in marine protected areas. And we're working with a number of different partners there. Um, and we've been contracted by the Bahamas National Trust. And our first project that we did in 20, um, 2019, the summer of 2019, with my graduate student, Laura um, Isaac Norton, uh, and she, is, she came down and spent the summer there looking at reproduction in, in a marine protected area. What we did is we repopulated an area that had been fished out. So we worked with the local um, the, the local Bahamian students and, and fishermen and staff. And we worked with Catherine Booker, who was the lead in the Bahamas. And then more recently, we've been in Grand Bahama working with the Bahamas National Trust with Jewel. And this is a project that we help the fishermen to learn more about the life cycle of the conch, but also the ranching of the conch. And then I've got some very exciting news to share with you that we've been building mobile queen conch hatcheries, which we've been doing in partnership with Catherine Booker. This has been funded through the Richard Snyder Trust. And so lots going on in the Bahamas and uh, more to come. 
So this gives you an idea of what we're doing in Grand Bahama with the conch ranching. We put out a shallow penned in area and then we tagged conch and put them inside the area. Some of them were mature and some of them were, were still sub-adult juveniles. And so we work with the fishermen in order to understand how long it takes to grow a conch to maturity. And then the great eczema work is, here's um, the work that we did with the repopulation of conch into the marine protected areas. I should share with you that the reason it's important to do the repopulation is because if you remember early on in the presentation, I talked about how important it is for the conch to come together to copulate for breeding. If the conch can't find each other, then they won't be able to breed. So one of the things that we do as part of the restoration conservation work is repopulate areas at a density that's ideal for reproduction. And here's an inside look at the conch hatchery, the mobile hatchery, that has been completed and has been shipped down to Great Exuma in October. I'll be going down there to operate it for the first time with Catherine Booker. And it's 100% solar powered. So it's very, um, very self-sufficient that way as well. And then I'm gonna take you down now to Curacao. Uh, we are uh, scientific advisors for a project that is located in Curacao at the Curacao Sea Aquarium. And so I don't know if any of you have been down there, but it's a very interesting place to have a conch hatchery. And I work um, very closely with the team. This is when I was able to visit in, um, that was in January of 2020, just before the pandemic. I was able to go down there and we talked about how we could build a hatchery. And since that time, they have been operating there in their second year now. But what's so interesting is that in these pools that they have, which is where they have some of their, um, some of their, their animals, such as dolphin, they have the conch in there. You can see them. They're in there and they keep the place clean and grazed and, and uh, help to maintain the bottom habitat for the dolphin that are in there. So they're able to collect egg masses right there. So they have a, a breeding population that's right there at the, at the aquarium. And I was able to go down there and snorkel and, and see that firsthand. So here's the team in the left-hand corner. They call the Queen Kong in Curacao, Kako, um, oh, I hope that I have that right. Um, actually, I'm not sure I remember exactly what they call it. So I'm not gonna, not gonna name it out. I have to look it up. So um, here we go. This is, is inside their hatchery. This is their egg incubation in the lower right-hand corner. And then here's one of their juvenile conch that they've raised and then their phytoplankton area. So their hatchery is quite large and they're able to produce, um, they just had a batch that they produced about 5,000 conch. So it's very exciting, uh, the work that they're doing down there as well. Carco, that's the name of it. Okay, I knew it'd come to me. So as we look at the benefits of queen conch aquaculture, I just took you through the various stages of aquaculture, but there's very, besides the fact that we can do restoration of the species, there's so many socioeconomic benefits. Being right there in the community, that's a number one priority for us is to work directly with the community members and the fishers. And to see that science and community interaction, the fishers are able to work with us, they're able to help with the project, collection of egg masses, um, location of nurseries, helping us with the operations. And then we also share the science. So it's a really nice relationship. We also pay the fishers and to be able to diversify their livelihoods. We do a lot of training in aquaculture and training and conservation, professional development of the local students and staff that are on the island. And then it becomes a co-management of the resource as we work together especially in places like marine protected areas. So here's just a few snapshots of the type of training that we do. Um, it's 
this is a very, um, as I was actually telling Sam earlier, this is a very important time in my life. I'm in what I call my legacy years. It's really important for me, who I've been working with the species for over 40 years, that I can share that knowledge, that I can pass on that knowledge and that that knowledge is spread throughout the communities of the Caribbean. So here you can see some of the work that I do when I'm down in Puerto Rico, um, teaching, we, we um, do hands-on, and I'm so very proud of the staff um, in, in Puerto Rico, in Curacao, and in the Bahamas. Um, and we do a lot of training through WhatsApp, you know, asking questions, sending photos, but I also try to be on the ground in Puerto Rico um, about every four to six weeks. For, I stay for about a week when I'm down there. This is some examples of the community of the fishers being involved, um, helping us pump seawater, helping us put tanks together, collection of egg masses that we talked about. And also we have a great group of contractors um, that help us with the plumbing and putting together the systems. It takes a village. And then we do, we do exchanges. We, ha we had last November, we had Bahamian fishers come to Puerto Rico and they um, were able to talk about the way that they fish in the Bahamas, the way they fish in Puerto Rico, how a fishing association works. And then we also did a tour of the hatchery as well. So that was a, a really um, amazing exchange of ideas together. And then we do community events, um, which we had one in June, and we invite the community. We have our funders that come down and see us. And so that's all very important part of making sure we share the information of what we do um, in, in the local communities. So I talked about training. Um, we have many resources available that are that are that are available free um, of charge that would be the queen Kong aquaculture manual and also it's in english and also in spanish and soon we will have an online course uh, for teaching how to grow the queen Kong. and we have training videos so this is all part of the idea of making sure that knowledge is available in all different forms um, for teaching and for helping the queen Kong. Um, through aquaculture. And so I just want to let you know that um, the next time, hopefully I get to speak with you or that we're in touch, that I'll be able to tell you more about some new projects that are coming online. We have a project that will be starting in Jamaica. And we're also in touch with groups down in St. Vincent and the Gren uh, uh, Grenadas and Grenadines. And so I'm hoping that I can share more of that information in the coming months. And this is one way you can keep in touch with us. Um, we have a website um, that has a lot of information on it. And we have an active Instagram site um, at Queen Conk Lab. And then there's my email address. So very happy to stay in touch with you all and to continue to share information. And before I sign off on the presentation, before questions, um, I just wanted to invite you to come to Harbor Branch. Um, we'd love to have you come visit. We have a, a Ocean Discovery Visitor Center. We have behind the scenes tours and so if you're on the East Coast of Florida, please stop in and see us. We um, very much enjoy that. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and open up for questions. All right, uh, thank you very, very much, Megan. A great presentation, great work. And uh, thank you for, um, for giving us all a, a glimpse into to what you do. I can, um, uh, Megan had had a slide of uh, of the many ways you can you can you can track um, the work that that's happening. Uh, many of us here in the museum will will attest to the fact that she uh, her her Instagram follow her Instagram posts are are amazing and she's got lots of followers on staff here. We rec recommend recommend you highly that you follow. So there are a lot of questions I can see that um, 
have come in. I just have a quick one um, before we jump into those. You mentioned um, near the beginning of your presentation, just something, something about a wooden car. <laughs> Can you tell me about the wooden car in Turks and Caicos? That's very intriguing. Yeah, so there were six wooden cars in the Turks and Caicos and um, as you can imagine, in a very salty environment, there were there were six citrons that came down and the bodies rusted away. And so somebody was very creative and built a wooden car. So I was able to get one of the wooden cars and then one of one of our friends rebuilt it. So it was a fire engine red wooden car <laughs> convertible. <laughs> Excellent. Ingenious. OK. All right. We'll get to the more substantive questions now. Um, all right. Give me a sec here. There are several. Um, okay, I think we'll start with David, who asks, um, what are the natural predators to eggs and larvae in the wild? Okay, thank you, David. That's a great question. So what's so interesting about the egg mass is that it is, if you remember from the photos, uh, it's covered in sand. So as she lays it, she lays a very thin uh, tube, almost like the size of monofilament, and it's sticky. So as she lays it, a lot of sand adheres to it. So we actually haven't found that there's any predation at the egg stage. There's sometimes little worms and um, copepods and little um, organisms that are living like amongst the eggs, but they're not eating the eggs. And the eggs are also inside three layers. There's the egg capsule, there's a, a, a spiral uh, thread, and then there's an outside um, uh, layer and then the sand. So they're very well protected. But in regards to the larvae, as soon as they hatch, they are very vulnerable to predation. So anything that eats zooplankton, like fish or other crustaceans, they're going to be eating the gastropods, the little larvae, as they're swimming and drifting in the ocean. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, David. A uh, question from Helen. From where do Florida restaurants import conch? Yes, um, so that's an interesting question because of the fact that the Florida conch fisheries is closed and has been for, for many, many years. So most of the conch that's brought in is from some of the more large scale fishing areas, which would include Jamaica, would include Turks and Caicos, Honduras, Nicaragua, Belize, and it, there used to be conch from Bahamas, but that's um, not happening at this stage. Okay, thank you. Kimberly has a question. Activities at the fishery in Puerto Rico are fascinating. Has anyone considered a marine uh, agritourism tour through travel companies? She has some, some examples of travel companies. Yeah. Agritourism tours. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. And we're actually, um, starting to gear up to be able to give tours. So we have been providing them, but very informally. And so we've been able to have um, the tourism uh, board of Puerto Rico and also Discover Puerto Rico uh, come and visit. And they're very keen on starting to actually have regular tours that we can provide to the facility. So we're excited to add that um, into the mix of what we can offer. Excellent. Uh, Beverly has a comment, just fantastic work you're doing. I grew up in Nassau, Bahamas, and have always been concerned about the overfishing and exporting of the conch. Thrilled that you are raising and releasing so many back into the sea. I applaud you. Thank you very much, Beverly. Yeah, thank you, Beverly. Um, big accolades for the presentation from April. A uh, question from Helen. What educational work are you doing with K-12 schools? Okay, so at this stage, nothing, nothing specific. But what I wanna let you know, that is on our website, we have curricula that was developed to be able to be taught um, in the more probably the middle school um, and possibly high school. And it can be adapted for other grades as well. So we do have that curricula there and We'd love to be able to reach out and to work um, in that in that area as well. Thank you. Valerie asks, what are the lobes on the young conch? Yes, aren't they the coolest thing? Thanks, Valerie. <laughs> I think it's just so 
fascinating. Um, those lobes are, are soft tissue appendages that are attached to the animal. Um, and they come out and they allow the conch to be able to drift and swim. And they have little cilia on them. And so the, it allows the conch to collect the phytoplankton. And then they're also used for respiration. So they have a multiple functions. And as the conch gets larger, you can see that they have more lobes. They go to two to four to six. And then even at six, they elongate. And that's because the conch needs that stability at that stage. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Anne asked, where in Exuma is the conch farm? So it's in Great Exuma, and we'll be working with the township of Roll Town. Great. Abby asks, are there opportunities for students to pursue graduate studies with the Queen Conch Lab? Well, Abby, I would be delighted to have graduate students to come and work with us. We have lots of work to do and there's lots of research questions. So I would say a definite yes. Right. And last question I see here um, from Sabrina. Besides overfishing and hurricanes, what are some of the other threats to conchs? You mentioned degradation of seagrass habitat. Is that the result of runoff, development, et cetera? Yeah, so the seagrass beds are vulnerable to changes that are happening on the land. And so if there is um, any siltation, for instance, that's coming in, or if there's a lot of development along the shore, um, and that there's runoff that's happening in the seagrass beds, or just the simple, not so simple, but when the storms come in, they're bringing in and covering the seagrass beds. And then sometimes the seagrass beds are just getting over, uh, over abundance of epiphytes because there's not a lot of herbivores there to be able to eat them. And so that's one of the important things about bringing the conch back into seagrass beds. Gotcha. Um, one more question, Tom, um, what is the temperature range? In Texas, we have them in uh, the flower gardens at 80, but not in shore waters. Okay, so that's interesting because um, you're that's in the Gulf of Mexico. So the temperature range from a Celsius standpoint is optimally 27 to 29, which in Fahrenheit, that's going to work out to be about 79 or 80 to about 82. So that's really the optimal range. They will live in cooler water. And they'll live in a little bit warmer water, but not much warmer. And Maureen has a question. What in their diet creates the shell? Okay, so the shell of a mollusk is, and I'm just gonna grab one from behind me here. Okay, so this shell is produced by the mantle. And so when there's a live animal in here, the animal comes out and lays layer after layer. And for the conch, it's got like sort of like an orange to black, black spot mantle. And so when the conch is taking up calcium carbonate from the water, it's in integrating that in the mantle and then it's laying down a matrix. And it not only lays down the shiny, beautiful internal, but it also lays down the external, which is called the perestrachium. So the mantle can do two things. It can, the perestrachium protects it from the environment and then it builds new shell on the inside. And then they eat, they eat a microalgae or they eat, they eat small microalgae called epiphytes. Um, or diatom, and there is pigment in them, carotenoids, that help it to be able to reduce the pink color of the shell. Mm -hmm. So if you guys have any more shell questions, I've got the full shell display here that I can be happy to answer <laughs> more questions around that. So the, so what's in the diet can uh, contributes to the color in the shell, but where 
the shell is coming from has more to do with the calcium carbonate and not so much with the with, with the diet. Exactly. All right, gotcha. Okay, I had a question. Um, all these great projects around the Caribbean. Um, have you have you ever explored doing something in in South Florida? Right. So we have done done some experiments here at Harbor Branch. We did the breeding experiment to determine if we could breed them in captivity, and that was really a breakthrough to be able to do that. Um, and then we've also raised different larvae here from the different species. So in regards to working in South Florida, um, the most important thing in South Florida is to be able to keep the Kong aggregated for, for spawning. And so that's what the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission group does. They're the ones that oversee the surveys and how many conch are, are in the waters, but they also help to maintain healthy offshore populations which is why the eggs can be laid. So there's a lot of work that's being done that way, but I also think that it's that one of the things that we'd like to do for, I, I forget who asked the exact question about working with K through 12, but that's one of the things that we'd like to do is, is certainly work with South Florida in regards to being able to teach about the importance of the Queen Conch and maybe do some Conch in the Classroom type projects. Mm -hmm. It has a nice ring to it, Conch in the Classroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. Lots of folks saying great presentation, which it absolutely was. And, and thank you for, uh, thank you everybody for your questions and, and Megan for your responses. And thank you again for your work, um, both what you do in the field and all your great work in, um, in your outreach and in, and in, and in spreading, spreading the good word to, um, to everybody. So um, thank you, Megan, and uh, keep it up. And we'll look forward to seeing you again. And thank you everybody for joining uh, for this program. And uh, within the next day or two, this will be recorded and up on our website if you'd like to share it further. And uh, we hope you'll, you'll join us for the fifth lecture in, in October and have a wonderful rest of your day and evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you all.